Thank you so much to the support team in India. We have India, uh, Kentucky, and New Jersey yep. represented uh, today uh, through video. And which countries are here? I saw some, but I'm going to ask you one more time. Let's see. Who's here? Who's here? Where are you? Where are you? We've got Mexico. we got Turkey, Egypt, Argentina, Greece, Philippines, Serbia, Romania, Brazil, Belarus. Try not to repeat here. We have Italy. We have Yemen. We have oh, Sri Lanka, Ukraine, Spain. Wow, look at this. Germany, I may have said before. Fantastic. Chile. If I didn't say you, you can yell at me later. Senegal. Mauritius. Egypt. Egypt, Mauritius, Sri Lanka, Senegal, Ukraine. Okay, I'm, Philippines, I'm signing Senegal. out here, but I'll be I'll jump back in if it seems necessary and take it away. Hey guys, you know, hola, uh, bonjour, um, guten tag to all of you. I wish I could say hello in all of your languages, but uh, salam alaikum to Egypt, of course. And I'm so excited, you know, uh, languages and cultures are my thing, and I'm. So completely hot up about it, you know. I think that you're too, and it's it's my thing. And uh, I, I'm not a professional material creator. I'm a teacher, and so I'm sharing with you some of the ideas. Um, let me first start off by saying that oh, hola, hola, Argentina. Uh, I uh, am from Germany originally, and came to the United States to go to college here, and got stuck, and now living here. And um, I taught um, English in Germany, and then I studied um, teaching German as a foreign language to Turkish students in Germany, and also specifically to Muslim students. And uh, when I came to the United States, I taught German, college French, and, and school French, and uh, English, of course, uh, ESL. Um, and so, um, you know, um, so I have a uh, an approach to my presentation that is uh, kind of straddled. You know, um, one of them is as a foreign language uh, approach, and one of them is ESL, learning something uh, in another language and culture where you live in the country. So I'm I'm bringing those two perspectives in here because um, I I will stay with that perspective because I saw that many of you in your um, in your participations in class indicated that you all come from both of those camps too, so I'm not going to focus only on one camp in my presentation. So let's go. Uh, we're talking about today about um, what makes language authentic to students, what motivates students. Uh, I talk about ESL and EFL, and there's a typo right there, sorry about that. English as a foreign language um, is what I learned when I learned English. And English as a second language is what we teach in the United States to immigrants that come here. <clears throat> we talk about authentic language for communication and academic content. And practical ideas, of course, that's my favorite part. And um, I give you my contact info. And I have two very active blogs and other social media. And I invite you to join me there um, to exchange information later. Okie dokie. Um, and um, so first, let's talk about English language learners, the ones that I will talk in my presentation. So I broke it down in this chart in, um, in the two groups, in the USA and outside of the USA. So in the USA, where I live right now, we have immigrants um, like myself and my child, who is bilingual. And when they learn English, they learn it by completely by content. Um, and um, they learn it um, by way of learning academics. So in, th in this case, language is the key or the road to content. International students that come here and study English for the purpose of studying English in universities often have a syllabus-driven um, instruction, and language is the content for them. And that's pretty much true outside of the United States in most cases, um, even K through 12, um, English as a foreign language and adults English as a foreign language, in language is the content, which makes a huge difference um, when you think about how students are moving through language learning. So what implications does it have for learning? And does it mean anything? And do we need different methods um, when we talk about EFL and ESL? So here's, here's how this all um, comes together with learning vocabulary. 
In ESL classes, many students do not have enough um, exposure to words and language, and they get this small sec section or slice of language. And I call this kind of like watering, you know. Um, they don't get enough water and uh, vocabulary in language, and um, that's why oftentimes their language grows really slow. Let's look at how um, ESL students here in America do this. They get too much watering. Uh, they get they get language a mass from every angle, and it's so much that they cannot decipher it and can make sense out of it because they're completely buried under language. So they are like drowning. So, however, both groups have to learn vocabulary, and it all depends on the right amount of comprehensible input they get. And I saw that some of you guys are not language teachers, so um, it's really important that I give you a little bit of reference here. I don't want to talk about theory, but I give you the link here that you can go to to learn more about the concept of comprehensible input, which means that we need to give them just enough language that they can gather the content and the context of what we're talking about without being overwhelmed. And giving comprehensible input is really, really, really hard if you have never learned how to do it. So all language learners have in common that they need to learn vocabulary because that is the, the these are the building blocks, the brick of the language, and the grammar is kind of the mortar in between. So. Uh, vocabulary must connect to learners' interest in life experience, or they will not break. And and it's so important. And I, 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 you know, not not to think that we intentionally do this, but many times um, we teachers drive the content of our life lessons too much in our own interest, in our own experience, and our own learning style. And and it seems to me that a lot of language teachers are really really good in grammar learning. And they love to study grammar, they love to monkey around with grammar, and they think that this should drive everybody's language experience and drive um, vocabulary instruction by grammar um, practicing uh, needs. And so, um, and sometimes teachers go just by learning from textbook chapters. They say, this is chapter one, two, three, three, four, five, and that this should drive my instruction. And um, they're not uh, going by the um, fact of connecting this to the learner's interest. And what is their motivation to listen, speak, read, or write, and learn vocabulary in all of this? You know, are they connected to it? So um, I have the assertion that lessons need to be planned around reasons to communicate and not grammar topics. So what is the reason that we, that we even open our mouth and ears? Is it to learn? you know, the passive voice or the imperative, or is it to um, tell somebody to do something with TPR and uh, they actually have a reason to do something. So this is what, what we kind of talk about. So I made the assertion that it's important to have authentic communication. But what is authentic communication? And of course, the question is not easily answered because that depends. You know, for some kids, like in the USA, when they learn English, their authentic communication is to get content in the lesson. They want to learn math, they want to learn science, they want to learn language arts. And that to them is really authentic because they need to pass the test at the end of the day. So another student in another country may be very motivated because they want to come to study in the United States or they want to read um, tech journals and they have a motivation that makes it authentic to them. Now, that also depends on the age group, like little kids probably have a completely different authentic need than older students have. So, like you said, and, and this is com completely something that came out in the pre-class discussion, it depends completely on the learner group, and there's no one-size-fits-all for everybody. So, but how do we always know? In my case, you know, I taught pre-K, I taught small children up to seniors in foreign language, all groups. I taught farmers. I taught um, people that were not really very educated. And how do I know what's authentic to them? So in my case, I always ask them, "What do you want to learn?" So uh, let me just just quickly cover the ESL side in the USA before I move on to the EFL side. So 
in the USA, of course, you know, it's all about um, the vocabulary needs to support teaching content. So we need to have very, very grounded vocabulary instruction guided for the student, carefully scaffolded so they can decide for content. Because it is horrible when you sit in the classroom and you have to perform and do a task in another language and you don't know how to do it. And I know that many of us can relate to that because we lived in other countries. So just a quick slide here. Um, in, uh, in regular classrooms, teachers are mostly content teachers. They have no language learning whatsoever. But for those who are interested in getting more information on this, um, there we got can do descriptors that tell you exactly what a child can do at a certain language level in English in reading, writing, speaking, and listening. <clears throat> Go to the website and you can look at each grade level and each content area, what students are actually able to do. So um, with that in mind, the teacher can then define language objectives for each lesson to um, make sure that language is always an integral part of any content lesson, which in general does not happen in the United States currently. And with that, teachers then can define how they address the domains of reading, writing, speaking, and listening in the lesson, what words the learners critically need in order to uh, manage the lesson. And they can provide background knowledge, give them visual cues, and scaffold the heck out of the lesson. So let's move on to EF, EFL style because that's the largest group of participants in this class. So I just do a short section on ESL, of course. So my first question is, why should anybody learn the English language? Is there a reason for them to um, see English, English as relevant? And how can you motivate them? And I'm specifically thinking of somebody in our group called Philip, who said he's teaching engineers in Germany. I think it was Philip and said that his students are really not interested in it and um, he has trouble getting them motivated. And that makes a lot of sense because the students are there to study, um, you know, um, engineering and they are not in language school. So evidently, if they were so interested in language, they would have studied languages, right? So, you know, evidently Philip has a big problem on his hand. Um, I'm just throwing this in here because I always believe that um, the role of music and rhythm is incredibly important when we do anything with language. Um, music chunking language into manageable units. And I don't know about you, but do you remember when you were learning languages or before you even learned languages, you could memorize songs in other languages and you didn't even know what the words meant, but you can say them and still remember them today. And that's the kind of power that music has. You know, I wish we all had a fluency MC in all of our classrooms. So, um, evidently, going back to the lesson, um, you know, students also need to have fun. And when they have fun, they also build more community in the classroom. And um, it's not about, like, let me go back to us older learners. Um, do you remember when you were in language class and you could count out which sentence was yours to answer and you focus completely on like the closed text, what you needed to say, and, and you kind of shut off for the rest of the lesson because you didn't feel like it was really for you, and you just picked out that part, part that you need to, to perform in. And so that's not fun and that's not building community, really. So the essential question then is, does using the language or words fulfill a real life function for the students? Because they need to have that in order to connect. Language always must have a purpose. So um, what, what are real purposes for students? You know, they can even be academic topics. They don't need to be um, kid stuff. Um, how do we get students to tell us how, um, what they want to learn? So I propose to use graphic organizers, Venn diagrams, and so forth to ask students what they want to learn about a certain topic. Let's say you are covering weather in your language lesson um, and ask the students, you know, what are, what are things you want to learn about expressing about weather? What are words and phrases you want to learn? And then let them create a graphic organizer or Venn diagram and I guarantee you 
they come up with the same stuff that you would have taught them anyway, but it's coming from them and it makes it authentic for them. And then, of course, you know, um, find out and give them the language chunks and high frequency phrases and phrasal expressions to go with that. Passwords, words that they can use interchangeably in each lesson and they can always rely on. Or use letter words where um, they can build more sophisticated ways of expressing something and keep track of it, like on the wall, for instance. One other way of making um, language learning um, specific in the classroom and authentic is using TPR and storytelling TPR. This is an idea coming from James Asher and was developed uh, many years ago. And my own teacher in the United States was trained by Asher in his own program. I gave you like a little um, reference here for people that don't know what it is to look it up afterwards. It's a way of somebody giving commands and other people acting something out. And it's so cool. You can do this on day one, on the first day, and people already feel like, oh my god, I can do something in my language, in a new language, and I feel so successful. And you can make it as um, complicated and involved as you want to go. Um, you know, um, but the key is, you know, in TPR to um, get the students to feel successful. And of course, it only engages the listening skills as a drawback. Kids can also um, work with words and anchor words with um, shape and concrete poetry, with, which is authentic to them because it's their own creation, it's their own work. Here are some examples of some vocabulary around bike a vocabulary about ice cream, and this is about flying and airplanes. So you can, the, the sky is the limit of what you can do with kids. You know, they can do their own concrete poetry. Even with three or four words, they can do a lot of stuff already. So um, let's come to our fun part. Party! You. Um, so this is how I propose to teachers that they teach when I teach other teachers. Oops, my art on this one. Um, what is a um, the communication reason that um, you even teach vocabulary? We talked a lot about that in our discussion before class, and people were saying, "Well, you know, I pick a reading, or I use the text that I'm left to cover, or." Um, now, these are the words I need to cover, and I'm very careful in picking them out. But how about if you let your learners decide what they want to learn? And they really can do it. And the uh, uh, method um, I'm using for anchoring my uh, proposal in is called Inquiry Learning, and I give you a link here to that. Inquiry Learning is a learning method where um, the worlds of the learners and the teachers merge into a community of learners where the students are also driving what they want to learn. And their entire inquiry learning schools run with this method, and it's pretty darn awesome. So let's talk about that. So teachers think that they would give up control when they use inquiry learning, but let students come up with the ideas of what they want to learn and what's authentic to them. But uh, this is actually not such a bad idea, because um, every language teacher um, that teaches in another country and not mother tongue language like me. We don't know everything about the language. So many times I don't know every word and I don't know every phrase. And and sometimes um, my learners come up with better ideas to what they want to learn about something. Plus, you know, I'm of a different generation and I'm not necessarily in the same things that they are. So it frees me of the responsibility to be the only source of what we cover in class and brings their voice in. Um, when students become um, lear teacher learners, they increase their knowledge exponentially so much more than before. And um, students are much more successful. So everybody wins in this. You know, I win because I learn new stuff and the students win because they become learners. So, how can we also brainstorm on words and concepts with students that they want to learn? Um, some of you be teaching uh, probably in schools where you don't have all 
kinds of technology available and some of you have all kinds of technology available. So for those of you that use a blackboard or whiteboard or paper and pencil, um, I suggest to use associograms for that um, where you can um, get your kids evening groups. And I, I like to get my learners on the floor, even adults, everybody on the floor, big poster boards. Um, roaming around and uh, coming up with ideas in a less formal way than sitting on formal seating arrangements. In group work um, with post-it notes, and I give you like a little link here for how to look this up, um, this activity, or in puplets. Puplets are really cool. They're just a, um, a digital version of, um, of sticky notes. So you can use that, um, each person can use their own device, or they can use one device together, or you can even use the whiteboard or smart board in class. In any case, you know, um, if they're anchoring in action with um, thinking and speaking, it's much more anchored, as you all know. Um, so for lesson planning, again, to reiterate what I said before, I'm using a backward approach. So. My first question is, why are we communicating? Why should anybody even care? And you know, if we decide that we want to communicate about, um, let's say, weather um, today, we can decide together in the class what words we need to communicate about weather. And then the other question is, what grammar is then needed to communicate effectively with those words? You know, sometimes you need ordinal numbers, sometimes you need questions, forms, and that kind of flows naturally from the communication reason. And what activities provide opportunities for authentic communication? And so I'm going to present you later with some practical ideas. And then last, you know, how will you and the students know that they communicate effectively? So it's about assessment, you know, but not assessment in the traditional sense where we test the chapter and say, done that, have done that, been there. But the award, reward that comes from really communicating effectively about something that you care about. So then once you decided what you want to do for your authentic speaking reason, you need to gather resources. And when I say you, I mean everybody in class, not just the teacher. So um, you know, it could be web pages, it could be, um, you know, word books, it could be all kinds of different resources that need to be gathered in order to execute a lesson. This is actually um, a way of really also effectively teaching multi-level classrooms, which I many times had in my classes. Many times I had students that were actually of different levels of experience. And so, um, you know, it was really, really cool to, you um, to have the students gather their own resources for each level of um, experience and come up with their own activity ideas, you know, um, that they really own. <clears throat> so, of course, you know, um, one of the things we can start to do um, introducing lessons of topics is um, use YouTube videos with songs. And they are like <clears throat> songs in English about every topic in the world, even those I don't wish I would see there. Um, you know, I gave you some examples at the end of my slides um, to where to go to find those, so students can um, can get started the lesson with really funky movements and dancing and uh, get into the mood. <clears throat> and then the next step could be for students to write their own music, you know, take um, a song they like and write their own text for it and perform it and thereby scaffold their vocabulary in an authentic way to them by converting it into music. And I know um, that Jason really is into that. He's a master of this. Um, another way of um, using vocabulary in class um, in, in the form of a different drill is doing living word walks where students write out their words of their interest or print them out um, from the internet and uh, make living sentences. Um, they, um, you know, when you um, let students uh, mention the word, somebody that has the word actually in their hand gets up. And connecting action, listening, speaking, moving, all of this in, in one person, you know, really anchors concepts in the brain and makes um, language so much more 
um, functional for students. Here's an idea for vocabulary um, about um, stores or rooms of a house. So one of the things I always did with my students was that when you talk about a house, for instance, what what kind of things do you want to know about a house? What kind of words? And then we used um, a masking tape or some tape and mapped out the floor the students did and made all the rooms on the floor and then put the words in the, in the, in the rooms and did actions with that imitating to be in a house. And so they really gathered a lot of um, experience from doing all of this because they were actually doing an action, an authentic action, um, for using the words and they drove the instruction. And the same I did like for stores, when you talk about stores and shopping and streets and city and giving directions, we did the same thing with tape on the floor where students um, mapped out their own street with stores and uh, did their own role games in that. So just an idea. Um, kids today, no matter in what country we are, are maker kids. Kids today are not willing to sit there and just digest um, silently the language, but they really want to do something with them. For instance, um, let them do uh, make a game. And different countries have different games that uh, work for them, so that's a really cool thing that we can um, introduce culture with that. Um, but for instance, when you teach English, teach them about ropes and ladders and um, about all kinds of the traditional games. Or they can craft something with words, can write a story, um, they can do their own role play or story thing, or they can make a movie, which is what my students love the most. They love to make movies and edit them, and they make them really, really cool. Um, one time I was teaching at a place where my students um, made their own uh, play about vocabulary they learned, and um, of course all my students always did crime stories or something with, you know, something really wild. And I had colleagues come in the classroom because they were worried that my students were out of hand or rowdy and they didn't take into account that they may be learning at the same time. Um, another way today that kids can uh, use words and scaffold them is by um, um, using infographics, making infographics. And I'll give you a link here to, um, to find um, ways of free tools of making online infographics. Infographics are really, really cool. They are just storytelling in a very condensed form, and they really show what students know and um, if they really got it, because they need to be very pointed and short on how they express things, and you can really see um, if they got the essence of what you were teaching or what they were learning. So let me talk about culture. Um, you know, the thing about culture is that when we talk about the same word, it means something completely different in another person's visual image that they have in their head. For instance, when we talk about um, what people sit on, chairs or a sitting tools, in one country it could be predominantly a carpet, in another country it could be something technical, in another country it could be like a traditional armchair. So we need to pay attention to when we teach words that we also give a lot of input to our students on what these words mean in the movie that goes off in the native speaker's head. And uh, for instance, when we talk about a house, I grew up in a house like this in Germany. Somebody else had, may have a completely different house in their culture. And so it's really important to show them examples of what real people live in. The thing about America is, um, my picture of America before I moved here was greatly influenced by TV and movies. And so I was completely wrong in my assumptions of what people lived in and, and living standard and all kinds of stuff based on what I knew from movies. So I think my teachers did not provide me with any cultural input when I learn my words. Let's talk about what grocery shopping looks like. Grocery shopping um, can look completely different. And here's a picture missing in this PowerPoint. I had in here I had an American grocery store um, here where um, everything is neatly packed and wrapped and um, disinfected and has price labels on it and everything. 
I know when I traveled through the world, a lot of countries that I traveled to had um, stores like this, you know, where you buy, buy stuff in different ways. And of course, I didn't know in America that everything is so um, sanitized and, you know, when I, before I moved here. What are some um, ideas about wedding or families and what people like to dress in? <clears throat> Same thing, you know, I mean, we have different ways of dressing um, traditionally and um, it really doesn't hurt to bring that in when we teach words. So how can culture be what in the classroom? Does the teacher need to provide all the answers? I don't think so because um, today's kids are information seekers and they can find their own answers. For instance, um, when you talk about sports, you can go to um, sports stores like the Sporting Goods online and let them find out sports items words and let them look at what they look like here. When you look at uh, grocery shopping, you can go to Walmart um, or another store. Um, this is the Forever 21 stores where all the young girls um, shop and then take the store um, for teenager fashion. And you know, just <clears throat> this Abercrombie and Fitch. Find out what people actually use and think of in the other country and kids can do that themselves when they um, go online and visit those stores. Another way of anchoring authentic vocabulary is to um, uh, make workbooks for kids and they can make them themselves and how can they uh, find the words. For instance, they can put in an image here, yeah? Um, one of them would be spring in America or whatever and then um, go to Google Images and find the right word and then create their own word box that they can then share with others. And you can either make a word wall with printouts or a, um, a website where they can store all the words. So how else can we use words? And a lot of the stuff I've already seen popping up on our pre-activity here, so I'm kind of recycling something that you already use. We can you do word art. One of them is um, using Wordle, W-O-R-D-L, where um, we can uh, make a word art of a lesson or, for instance, when you do an sociogram or a puppet of what you want to learn in class, you can just make a word art and put it at the wall, uh, kind of like a backdrop to what you're covering in class to make it even authentic. Um, another thing is to make um, games and crossword puzzles. And kids can make their own one. Here are just two examples of um, online tools where people can make, and I'm always saying kids, I'm sorry, I mean all learners. You know, my college students, I still call them sometimes kids, so I'm sorry about that. Um, they can all make their own um, um, tools and their own puzzles. And then where can you store them for free? You know, there are different things. You can have um, your own with IQ class, um, for instance, and open your own Moodle class, which is free for teachers. Or you can use something like Edmodo, Dropbox, Google Docs, or any of that sort to um, store all your stuff so it doesn't get lost, you know, because that's what happened to me a lot when I started teaching and had transparencies and pages. They all got lost in the big pile and um, I like to keep things much more organized in, in tools like online tools. Another um, thing that you can do with kids to make it authentic is because they all love social media. Um, um, make um, think kids do their own Facebook profiles. And here's a um, link where you can access fake Facebook profile templates. So you're not actually going on Facebook, you're just pretending to go on Facebook, but it's still authentic. And um, you can let the kids make up celebrity Facebook pages or their own ones. There's the sky's the limit, you know, they can do all kinds of stuff. And, you know, in those um, Facebook pages, you can actually use them for any teaching of any topic. You know, they can discuss vacations, they can discuss weather, they can discuss any topic that you can do in class. So, um, of course, you know, we, we already know from other classes and from your own life that words always 
are best taught in context of sentences and phrases and chunks because um, that provides the tools then for our brain and our neuroplasticity to build the lasting connections for language in our brain. And that takes a lot of um, practicing and scaffolding. As I said before, you know, um, physical, total physical response, but, and here's an info on it, um, but let the kids give the commands on what to do. Don't let the teacher be on um, the control of the classroom. You know, we do too much teacher talk, and I've seen research that in foreign language classrooms, many children have less than four minutes of actual speaking time in a normal typical class. And that's just not enough. So we need to change that around and let the kids take control of things. Of course, you know, there's um, the power of music that I said before. Go to MC English and Color Tunes um, on YouTube and get all your um, English that you um, get inspired by. And maybe you come up with your own tunes too. You know, learn from Jason. Here's another way of making authentic language um, happen in the school. Do a scavenger hunt, let kids get into groups, hide an object in school, write out instructions for others to find the object, and then um, the other groups will get either a phone or walkie-talkie, and if you don't have that, you can also use paper instructions. And um, it's really best if they can speak in walkie-talkie or phone. And one group gives spoken instructions to the other group on where to go in the school and um, has guides the other group to find the object. And the group that works together best, the two groups that work together best in finding this the fastest way are the winners. And all my learners love this. Adults, kids, they all really enjoy doing this and they got really into this thing. Um, so here's a book that has thousands of activities of um, you know, language uh, vocabulary activities in it, and um, um, I'm part of the fifth edition that comes out next year. My um, part of the book is all the stuff on technology, so you can um, read many, many activities for any country and language, and English, of course, uh, applicable to English um, in one book, and it's just really awesome, you know, very practical and specifically geared to lower grades. Sorry, you teachers of older people. So, um, and then I wanted to say that language learning is not hard, if communication is at the heart, and motivating learners to dare to speak with a real live word technique. And here is the information on how to get in touch with me. Um, I have a, an ESL blog that's read in about 150 countries at this point, and a technology blog too that I use to support me in my ESL teaching. And I also have Twitter, and you can get me there, Body ESL, and I'm on LinkedIn, and I can connect with me there. And so from now on, I would like to go and take your questions. Questions, anybody? Anybody having questions? Jason, do you have questions? It's terrific, and uh, I, I don't. I'm as as excited about how well you did in this presentation. Although I knew you'd be fabulous, as the interaction in the chat box was just fantastic, and. I have some questions I wrote down. I see one here about adult learners, and I, I also saw another one about uh, young learners, and a lot of things about ESL, EFL, which I think is very interesting because uh, we could learn a great deal from someone with your experience uh, because you have both experiences. So let, let's see um, if we have any questions right now. What is more important, intrinsic or extrinsic motivation? What would you say? Well, of course, it's, well, I think that um, in my life and the lives of the learners I worked with, I found that um, 
the extrinsic motivation of passing a test or getting into, for instance, passing the TOEFL test to get into American University or something. That's definitely an extrinsic motivation because you, you just have to pass this gate that you need to pass. But um, that's only a very short-term lift, you know. I think the intrinsic motivation is if you really, really want to um, do something with the language, you know. And, of course, intrinsic is always much more important for that, you know. And that's why it's so hard when we teach students that have to take our classes and don't want to be there, you know. So that's why we need to have all kinds of tricks in our tool chest to make them get on board, you know. <laughs> Yes, and, and I find, uh, just to add to that, that when you have situations where the extrinsic motivation appears very high, like the TOEFL, you might think that's great, you have reason to be motivated, but usually situations like that increase stress. So when you have increased stress, uh, that is the big enemy of extrinsic motivation. You may be motivated uh, because you want to get that high score but uh, or get into or, or, or get past the interview for a job. But if you're stressed about it, then that can have a negative effect on your acquisition and your production of language. So how to get intrinsically motivated when you have an extrinsic motivator, you know, doing something fun and engaging with TOEFL materials, right. uh, for example. Hey, right? you know, can I just share some real quick story about the TOEFL with you? TOEFL was like, I took this in Germany, in Cologne, and uh, and I was really leery because my, I had the feeling that I went into TOEFL with knowing really 150 words. That's how I felt, you know, because I felt that my language knowledge in terms of the words I knew was so limited. And all I knew was grammar, okay? And when I sat down in the TOEFL for the, um, and I already had a teaching assistant position in the United States, so there was a lot of stuff you know, hinging on this, right? So I got my written exam portion, and it uh, talked about um, the fact, um, uh, what is the benefit, what are the advantages and disadvantages of brick houses, okay? And I didn't know the word brick. <laughs> brick, and the whole darn essay was about brick, brick houses. And I was so ice cold. My whole body went completely ice cold. And I thought, oh my God, I'm so lost. And I had to just dilly dally around and, and come up with some stuff, you know. Ultimately, for I don't know what reason past TOEFL, which I shouldn't have because I didn't know what bricks were. And I'm here now, but um, I don't know why. You know, but, but I'm telling you, you know, those words, <laughs> those words are really killing us, you know, if we don't know them, right? Yes. Absolutely, uh, 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 Crystal. Before before I, uh, I I ask you some other questions that I wrote down, um, are you going to be available just after you think uh, in a class page to answer questions? Do you have a few minutes? I do. Great, and and everyone, and you'll get used to this. We have a Facebook group for this class just as we have them for uh, Charles's class and Drew's class. If you're a Facebook person, you definitely want to get in those groups because that's a great way to interact about this class uh, with Crystal. Uh, but also, as Crystal just said, thank you, Sylvia's got the link to the group and we will put that, I'll put that in an announcement that goes out to everyone. So you'll be sure to get that. Uh, thank you, uh, Maria Ines also reminding us we can copy the chat. But if you have questions in the chat, you are more than welcome to, if we don't have time right now, to ask them in the Facebook group or if you prefer on the class page where many of you have already been uh, to interact with, with Crystal and each other. Um, well, let great me, comment let me, here, Ask. Let me, just, uh, let me just come in for a second. You know, I will not be available from tomorrow for about two weeks um, because I'm not able to get to email. But I will uh -huh. keep on monitoring activities, and after the two weeks, I can go back into the Facebook okay. if there has been ongoing. Uh, don't think that I dropped the, off the face of this earth. I will be back. <laughs> I'm completely right. hooked to the social media stuff, so keep it, keep the discussion going, and I will come back. Okay. Uh, 
I think I lost Jason's video and no, 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 I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I turned my video off, but but I'm here. Um, great. So so let's see. We only have a couple minutes. So what I wanted to uh, do is uh, someone wants me to wrap. Well, I can do that, but I don't want to steal the the show here. Uh, but a couple questions I think were really important. One was about translating when students, and this is a big problem for EFL students, but ESL also, uh, but uh, what would you suggest if students are doing too much translation? This is a great question for any of uh, the presenters. So what exactly is your question, Jason? <laughs> uh, when students are doing too much word-to-word -word translation, um, and oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, well, here, here's what I do with students who try to do that, okay? I make them take a very simple sentence like, I like to eat hamburger and eat hamburger and drink cup or whatever, and make, uh, and, uh, well, make a sentence that's a little bit longer, maybe. And then I go and, and make them use, like, um, um, an online translating program. And I let them translate it from in, from their native language to ten other languages, and then back to their native language, and see what the sentence looks like at the end. And it's usually completely butchered, you know. And they go, "Oh my God, I didn't understand that," you know, like Simon says. And um, and they're really shocked. And then I show them that um, you know, translating something doesn't work. Um, because we're translating it in the same structure that our own language is. And so, but sometimes it needs a, a real experiment, hands-on experiment, to learn how to do that. Excellent. Uh, I saw some great stuff here. My favorite one was uh, Sebastian said, uh, don't translate words, translate functions, right? Yes, uh, yes. The, the authentic language, the real situations that, that you talked about before, that's where you're going to get the chunks, the collocations naturally uh, when, when you do it that way. We have uh, extended the time here a, a little while. The, the support staff is definitely uh, now accustomed to us extending. <laughs> I'm back on video. Hello again. Are getting more accustomed to us extending. If you need to leave because it's 11 o'clock, I'll see you. Some of you can't stay, fine. But Crystal, are you okay for a few more minutes? You are. Okay, fabulous. So um, let's see. There were some questions about uh, how do we teach adults and teenagers? And wonder, I'm wondering if, if you have any feelings uh, about differences that might be most important given what you've been saying today uh, yeah, in, about I, I, authentic authentic language yeah well i think that um you know evidently um the younger the children are the less grounded is their awareness of the native language um structures of language okay so for instance when jace jace, jace how old are your kids uh, my kids, and you've seen them running around a little bit today, uh, my daughter is six, and my son will be 11 in a week. Okay, so forget that. I cannot use that example. But if we have, if we have littler kids, you know, um, we, we teach them by using the language also to use the structure. For instance, we don't say, today we use the imperative, um, and I teach you the imperative for second person singular. We would say, go and clean your room, right? Or go go party, <laughs> and and so uh, for adults, you know, they they already have that completely firm linguistic system. So adults are craving more structures because yeah. they want to know why am I doing this, you know? Yeah. And so this is kind of deviating just a little bit from the vocabulary topic. But when adults learn something, they want to learn why why uh, do I use um, why isn't it drived in past participle in English, you know? And I say, well, it's, a, it's an irregular verb, but they notice that. And so uh, as a teacher, we can capitalize on that and ask our adult students or post-adolescent uh, students to discover their own grammar structures, you know, and, and find them out themselves, you know, without me telling them about it. What, what, yeah, I, I agree with you know raising awareness and adults want to know why 
uh, curious teenagers want to know why. That's that's the critical thinking, critical reasoning that we all want to build in uh, everyone, right? As human beings, we, we want to do that. As teachers, that's what we right. want. But but what about when raising awareness uh, interferes? How can we, you know, how do we tell our students why? Because we don't want to say, you know, shut up and repeat. Um, we how do we raise awareness that they want at the same time we un, with the understanding that that can sometimes or often uh, make them not as fluent, uh, slow down their ability to acquire grammar structures. But what, what do you think about that? Well, I would, I mean, if, if you have like the couple of people in class that are real question askers, you know, and they really want to know, everybody has different personality types, right? I would say probably in my lesson that I would set aside a time where we could talk about that, but not to let it interfere with activities. You yes. know, I would say just honor the activity, and I would maybe, I'm I'm pretty drastic. I'm I'm the crazy teacher. Okay, I would put pictures up on the wall that say, like, um, no questions uh, right now. Just just let yourself fall into the activity or something. You know, and then I turn that around and say, okay, now you can ask your questions. You know, because that you need to be recognizing their intellectual. Um, curiosity, you cannot turn that off. But all the same, they need to trust uh, me to follow in the activities, you know, and not interrupt them by thinking about structure. Does that make sense? It does. And I think Alberto uh, just hit the nail on the head. If you make the classes fun, the activities, if, if they fall into them, as you say, if they're so engaged, they're not going to stop and think about it. So I, I think that's the best, right? And that's a, to me a measure of a very uh, of the of the best communicative language teachers is that that happens, you know, that that just happens uh, naturally. And and it's funny, you know, people always say, well, my adult students they would never do that, you know, they would feel too funny in doing that. That is complete bull. I'm sorry, I'm using slang. Every student likes to have fun. Every student likes to have fun, and and if you allow them that space, yes, you know you need to create that space. But when you are a very serious teacher and you're lecturing and you are just in charge, you know you're the only one knowing, then you turn that off. Yeah, yeah. Right from the yeah. beginning, and you cannot do that. You need to be a member of the learning community. Yes, I, th I think there are you know, two mistakes that are commonly made, and many of the teachers here, uh, we've been talking about this. One is to, to think something is fun and engaging as a teacher, and you're not paying enough attention to what the students' needs and interests are. And then another one with older kids and adults is to think, well, guys, just you know, be like kids and have fun, but what you're doing is actually... Uh, not interesting for older people. So this was this is this is very important too, because like you just said, everyone wants to have fun, but that doesn't mean we have to pressure adults into singing children's songs if they don't. If that's not what they want. So I think you know when Charles was doing action songs, that was a very important uh, issue. Where you know, do you try to push the student into the song that doesn't fit? Um, or do you look for other things that really fit? I think that's a, 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 a topic we need to continue to always think about, uh, depending uh, on who our learners are. I want to um, say something. Are you still there? I want to say something else about people that are really concerned with getting their students from point A to point B in a certain time to get them through tests or whatever. You know. In, in my language teaching times, I always had students that wanted to apply for scholarships or taking um, certain tests, you know, where they needed to master the language, whether it was TOEFL or the German test or French test, business test, whatever. And they were very motivated to reach their goal, you know. But when, when, um, when they had fun in the classroom and had activities that they really enjoyed, they did so much better on the test, you know, than they were hung up and tied up and like, oh, I need to get this done, you know, and they were traditionally learning. Uh, they didn't do as well as those ones that had set goals and um, engaged with the language. You know, does yeah. that make sense? Yeah. And, and, and too many teachers are too worried. They, you know, I work for the government too. I work for the government and I have all the rules from the government in licensure programming 
to telling me what I must do with my students. But there's still that space of the art of teaching. Mm. You know, it's not all about, um, you know, the rules from the outside. You can still, in that confinement, have your own art of teaching. That makes sense? Yes, yes. And and uh, there's something really important I'm just seeing here, which is maybe a good a good place to, to stop, which is about, um, but of course, we never stop in ELT techniques. We can keep going, just not not here. But someone said, yes, but not too much fun. And I, I think that ties into uh, what I was just saying a little bit. What is fun and what is engagement? So I use the word engagement a lot more than fun, mainly because, um, you know, when talking to teachers and training, mainly because, um, you know, if it's engaging, it should also be fun. They should be the same. But I know what some teachers mean. If fun means the kids are too crazy. If fun means the adults don't take it seriously or, or they think that, you know, it's, it's not, it's childish. I, I agree that, that that can't be it. It's about engagement. It's, right. it's about the activity with all the great language they need for whatever it is, business classes, someone just said, uh, TOEFL, uh, whatever it is, that they are in that activity and they're they're enjoying it and they're so focused on it that they're what I call learning when they're not looking. So I'll put that in there. Learning. Yes. Oh, yes, that's. You're not looking. No, that is cool. That is so cool. You're saying that, and and I can see that the word fun would could raise eyebrows. You know, with people thinking about fun in different ways. For me, fun is when students forget that they're learning. Yes, same thing. They come home, when they come home to their parents or their spouses if they're older and they say, today language, language, in language class I, we had so much fun, I forgot that um, they didn't learn anything. And they're learning the whole time. And right. it's not about jumping around and screaming and yelling and dancing and singing. It's about being, owning the learning experience. Well, it's if, about if owning... Can, yeah. This, this this is my this is my favorite topic. I hope you don't mind that I'm kind of taking over a little bit here. But uh, you and I are are kindred spirits when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but you know, let me just put something out there that I talk about more and more, which is that this whole idea of a dichotomy, you know, fun and learning, you know, entertainment and learning, is is so ridiculous. Uh, so you know, when when a, when someone is playing a violent video game. A child, and we agree this is terrible for a child. You should not be playing this video game. You should be learning something over here. The reason that we don't want the child playing the video game is because they're learning. They're learning things that we don't want them to learn, and that's and and that's fair that we don't want them to learn those things. But to say that's not learning, you know, to say that's not learning and this is learning, is is a myth. So, you know, it's, it, if they're engaged in the video game, guess what? Engagement <laughs> means they're learning. The question is, what are they engaged in? You know, and, and if we try to say, you know, don't do that, do this, and this is boring, this is not as engaging, then who are we kidding? And this is because of technology already changing, and I predict in the future, people will look back and say, what? We used to think entertainment and learning were separate? Or separable? <laughs> it, it makes no sense. So I, a, a word like edutainment, which now you hear even more, I think that's a misnomer in the future. It's not edu we need to put them together. Literally, education and entertainment are the same thing. That, that's just my opinion. Well, and uh, and that's and that's not completely agree with you, and that goes with that that whole idea that I have about the maker generation. And I think Brian and Alexander talked about that too in the past. You know, the makers, you know, they they own their learning. You know, they interact with it. They um, they make it their own. You know, it's not they're not waiting for the teacher to hand over or pour knowledge into their head, but they are making it happen. You know, and we need to give people an opportunity to do that. Yes. And that applies yes. to smaller, the younger learners, to adults, all the same. You know. And I think in that case, then they have fun because they're engaging authentically in something they love to do. Yes. Right. Yes. Absolutely. And that makes it that makes it then authentic. It's not authentic 
to tell jokes or whatever, you know, that may not be authentic for everybody, but it's authentic if they do something with learning that they love to do. Absolutely. Uh, and I think, you know, someone says, is this, learn is this fun too? I mean, for me, this is so much fun. And if someone said you had to, you have to attend this course and you have to do it this way and you have to, and Dr. Brody's going to give us a test and we're going to have to do this. To me, that would turn me off. So to me, what I'm doing here is 100% fun. This is where I want to be and what I want to do. But it's how it's presented. Uh, and I feel that, you know, this is a lesson also that we can bring to our learners. It's not easy because we have curriculums, we have rules in schools, but it's going to get easier, I strongly feel, in the future when people see how much more learning happens when people are not stressed, when people have more choice, when people are helping each other more and getting more social around uh, the content, which is what we're doing here. So, uh, and, and the last, the last... Hmm, sorry, go ahead. Please, please. Another thing I wanted to mention is, and this goes with something that you and also Nelly Deutsch is really big in. It's also about caring. Mm. Now, if I really care about my students, I want them to connect. I want them to to connect with the learning and with me, right? And whatever it takes for them to engage in learning is what I care about, you know? Because I care about them coming out of these instructional units with me with more knowledge than they had when they came in, right? And and I care about connecting with how they learn and how what makes them learn. And so right now, it's all about technology, you know? And and uh, if, if, I, if I look around me in the field of teaching and how many of my colleagues are proud to say, Oh, I'm not doing that kind of stuff, you know. I, I'm not even getting into this because it just takes too much time to get to know social media, blah, blah. Really? How do you connect with your students? It's like when I started teaching at a university in Missouri and my colleague had a picture, a poster from Spain from 1961 on the wall, partly displaying when he took his trip there, and it didn't appeal to his students whatsoever because it was old and grayish and bad quality and they thought this teacher is just so outdated, you know? So we need to connect with our students and what makes them want to learn and engage. And that's kind of a term from Nelly, the caring part, you know. Yes, yes. Dr. Nelly is absolutely <laughs> our mentor, all of us here for for that because she has the expertise and uh, the experience with technology, but sees it as the way to enhance connectivity and enhance relationships and caring for students. And without that, you know, people are going to say correctly, yeah, technology is, is, is you know, makes things worse. You know, it closes us off. It does this. There is that side. But I mean, how many people here, you just heard me, Dr. Nelly, how many people here, honestly, are, are not technology people? I'm not. I am not a tech person. I am not like Dr. Nelly. I don't have that at all. So, you know, we are not in this MOOC because we are tech people. We are in this MOOC to reach when we teach, to connect, uh, you know, to, to, and this is the beauty of it getting easier, technology getting easier uh, for people that are not excited about technology itself. We are excited about the ways that it is helping us grow, expand. And Dr. Nelly knows this, but she's someone who also knows the tech side. So, you know, it's it's so wonderful uh, that, that she's uh, the matriarch here for everyone. And don't worry, Dr. Nelly, matriarch doesn't mean you're old. <laughs> it, just, it just means every time I say the matriarch, I get in trouble. A matriarch has to do with, you know, the uh, the role you play. So... Anyway, um, the role, it's a role model person. It's an amazing role. Without it, where would we be? But we all have our roles here, and that's what we're, we're finding with this MOOC, too, is it's not just about, you know, Sylvia or some other. It, we are finding people coming in with all kinds of ways to contribute. So when we do this again, and I'll tell you a little secret, we will be doing this again, maybe sooner than you even realize, think. Um, when we do it again, we will 
bring in you know more people to to be in facilitator roles, presenter roles. Um, now that we know, you know who who is really going for this, uh, who wants to, who, you know who who is going to be good uh, to to put up there uh, and be more involved. So we are running out of time. So the WIS support, WIS, WIS IQ support staff is so great. They keep extending. But what they don't know is we will stay here all day. Not every one of us. but Some of us will just keep looking down. Oh, seven more minutes? Oh, 12 more minutes? Right? It's just feeding our... Uh... <laughs> But we do need to we do need to stay on schedule a little bit. A little wrap, please. Okay, we'll give a wrap. Let's see. Can you throw me some things to talk about? Nellie's wedding anniversary. Tell me about the anniversary, Dr. Nellie. I'm not even sure what it is. It's your husband and you. Happy anniversary, baby. Got you on my mind. Do you know that song? Or is it just me? You do. I'll try to do something better for you. Have fun, Dr. Nelly, when you're out, says Maria. What are your plans? Are you going out on the town to a restaurant? Oh, Mr. Deutsch, but we don't even know what he looks like. Can you show us a picture? This mystery man, where does he live? In Japan or in some other land? Or is he with you? Because we only see pictures of you and your dog and his name was Apple. I think that's it. He's more famous than your husband. What's going on with this? Where is this man? We never see him. Are you embarrassed? I can't believe that. That would be the case. You talk about trips all over the place with him, meeting friends out and doing so many things. Yes, your son's dog, he's got more fame and he's got a name. We don't even know your husband's. He's Dr. Deutsch, what about the first name? Does he have one? I'm starting to wonder, does he exist? Is he for real? Your anniversary with your imaginary husband? It can't be true. Tell me, you'll ask him the name, good for you. That will help and then you can tell us too. And we can make a discussion group on Facebook and discuss your relationship. Okay, what am I talking about now? Who wants to manage me? Nobody can do that. Can't you see? Fluency and C is too all over the place. And if you don't know me, Jason R. Levine, I also go by Jace. To catch me, you have to make chase and make haste because I'm all over the place. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Thank you. That's a true freestyle, you know. I'm not thinking about anything. It just kind of comes out unmanageable, incorrigible. Yes, Sylvia, I adore you. You give me, you're my muse. There's so much I can do when I see what you got to say. Put it in my raps. Thanks for all of your attention and your claps. <laughs> 95 cents, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm more than 50 cents. Okay, good. I don't have as many scars or bullet bullet uh, wounds, but I, I hope I can still represent and uh, you give me respect. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Uh, everybody out there, ELTs and ELT techniques, you have two choices now. Well, you have many choices, but if you want to connect more on uh, the topics from the class with our guest presenter, Dr. Uh, sorry, Crystal Rohde, you can go to the Facebook group, uh, Sylvia, can you throw that link in the chat again? Although I am going to put it in a message that we email to everybody out there. I'll put it in the course feed. Uh, that's the Facebook group. You can also go to the class page. Now the class page is where you were chatting before the class. It's where you launched this class and it's where you can continue to put comments about the class. Post class assignment. Who can tell me where to find this? Checking to see who who is who who could tell us where to find that in courseware. That's right. There'll be a tutorial. You'll get a notification, uh, and when you get that, it's your choice. If you would like to do that post class assignment to get a certificate for the course, you need to do four of them. It's up to you, four or more. So that will be available. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Brody. Clearly, people enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I love it. Are you kidding me? This is great. <laughs> great. Let's do that again. We will. We will. I'll come back for you. Goodbye, everybody. Have a Bye -bye. great day. Motivation rocks around the clock. That's how we do it with any music like hip hop from me. Bye bye from Bahrain. Bye bye from other countries. Let me explain. We got Mexico in the house, Italia. I was just there. 
Just last week, but now I'm back. I like to be everywhere, like down in Argentina and in Mexico. Don't you know when I flow, I need more claps and more countries to name. Bye from the Philippines, Sri Lanka. Oh, yes, Genova. That's where I was precisely. We got Germany and more Senegal, Budapest, Hungary. And also Tunisia, more Senegal, Sri Lanka. Oh, my goodness. Serbia, too, is here. And now we have to say bye-bye and have a nice day. Wiz IQ support, thanks for being here. You can turn us off, close us down. We still live on, on Facebook and in... And that's the end. Thank you, everyone. That was great.